Hey, Bob, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Well, you know, I've interviewed many, many business leaders and executives, but given everything that's happening around artificial intelligence, it seems like you are the guy I should have spoken to much earlier. So as a starting point, maybe just lay out the landscape in terms of what's all the excitement going on in AI at the moment. Sure. I think what we've seen is, is a progression of developments over time that has reached a point where technology has broken through and has become really very, very broadly useful. Uh, machine learning has been under development certainly for well over a decade. I mean, some of the advanced techniques have been yeah. under development throughout that time. But what's happened is by applying very large amounts of compute power and working with a large amount of data, particularly taking the data off of the internet and leveraging that, it's been possible to, to build these neural network-based systems that essentially learn on their own. They, they are able to take data directly out, take data directly and, and, and consume that data and over time begin to understand the relationships between the data items and ultimately to understand the semantics of, of what is happening inside stories and articles and technical publications. And by, by applying this you know, very large amount of data and, 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 and inputting it into these neural networks, they really have been able to reproduce what we, what we today think of as, as, as intelligence, uh, intelligence that previously only existed in, in the human brain now is is taking form inside these new uh, foundation models. They're called sometimes, sometimes they're known as generative AI um, or large language models, which is a very specific type of, of, of model that that is, is the power behind products like ChatGPT. That's a very good overview. For the audience, to make sure everyone's on the same page, am I correct in saying that these AI machines or engines are looking for correlations. They don't have the ability to understand causation yet. Is that correct? I, that, that is correct. Although it's interesting that over time, they, they begin to have more and more intuition on these things. As the models get bigger, they get smarter. And, you know, originally, you know, we, we said that these models can't do planning. Now we're seeing that they can begin to do some, some very simplistic um, things in, in, in planning and other, other higher level, level, level uh, thoughts. However, it's still early in their development. Uh, this is, you know, the fact that they're able to do what they can do is, is pretty darn remarkable. Yes, exactly. I was speaking to an executive a few days ago. He works for a very large financial services group and he sits on the executive committee. And he was telling me that there's a lot of consternation within the management and executive committees because they don't know how to respond to this. When I say he doesn't know how to respond to this, what it means is that they don't know if they are good at it, if they are bad at it, what is the technology they need to bring in in-house, how they need to change their business model to bring AI into their business. What has been your interaction with other executives on this topic? How are they responding to it? Well, I think everybody is trying to understand uh, how to take this technology and how they can apply it to their own uses to serve to better serve their customers more effectively engage and, and utilize their employees and and it's pretty clear there's a you know there's a multitude of different dimensions where that's possible recognize it's still very very early the products and services that that support this new technology are very nascent and there's very little out there that companies could quickly adopt today and and apply within their business I think that'll change over the next six months to a year in a couple of different dimensions. One, first of all, the vendors in the space, um, the vendors that build applications that run business are all incorporating uh, these, these large language models and AI into their products. And so we'll begin to see products and services emerging later this year uh, that are augmented with AI much like like uh, GitHub Copilot has been augmented by AI yes, and, and has enabled productivity improvements for developers, I think we'll start to see similar productivity improvements for visual designers and knowledge workers that are working with tools like like uh, Office and Google Apps, as well as as well as the people that are working behind a wide variety of business applications as AI gets incorporated into that. You know, another big part of this is understanding how you can apply AI to your business in a very specific way 
that helps you with your customers. You know, and that really requires some people to dig into the technology within an organization. So you need to have some technical capabilities within an organization to do that. And it's still the techniques and things that are, are going to be used uh, for companies to adopt and build AI applications themselves that are extremely nascent right now. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's going to, I think in the next 18 to 12 to 24 months, we're going to see a whole plethora of new technologies and, and services coming out to help companies to adopt AI and bring AI into their organization. But right now, a lot of it is really homegrown. And um, people are working with, you know, the very large uh, 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 commercial models like GPT-35 or GPT-4. Uh, they are doing, typically with that, they are doing prompt engineering to uh, take and augment uh, the questions that are being asked by users with more knowledge so that the, that the, the model can provide better answers. Um, those models are now having an op have an open API and can begin to call things. And I think that another way in which uh, which organizations will uh, enhance and use AI is by leveraging these models and working with the programming interfaces that they provide to really uh, to, to help connect to the different services within an organization. So we're going to see, you know, we're going to see a lot of evolution in terms of, of, of organizational adoption of AI in the next 18 months. But I don't think there is a single recipe right now. And the biggest, the best thing I can suggest is that people within organizations uh, uh, begin to play with and experiment with this AI technology. You know, if your company has people that are data scientists, looking at the open source models are very interesting uh, and understanding uh, how those could be applied because the open source models um, are not as general purpose as the com a commercial op model like GPT-4 or 3.5, uh, but they are much smaller and much more cost effective to run. So for a lot of cases, those will become the, the, the models of choice that people will use. But right now, I would say that, that development environments that enable people to easily work with these models within a corporation are just beginning to come out. I mean, it's really not even there yet, I'd say. And I think that's going to change pretty dramatically over the next 12 to 18 months. So we're in the exciting Wild West days of AI. From what I it is Wild West. It is Wild West right now. You know, I think what's what's really exciting, I mean, I, let me tell you the thing that, that, that I think is probably the most exciting is that, you know, when we saw some of these, you know, large commercial models, when ChatGPT hit late last year, I think it opened the eyes of a lot of people to what's possible. But then what's happened subsequently, uh, partially because of some of the work that Meta did um, in, re in, in making a, a available a model called Llama to researchers, yes. um, that became a spark that has, has really ignited a vast amount of open source creativity and development of new models. Literally, you know, dozens of new models are appearing in a variety of different forms. Uh, they're being fine-tuned uh, to take on very specific tasks. And you know, this is a tremendous amount of innovation happening in working with open sourced models. I mean, it was, it was really fascinating when, when Meta released uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, mo the, the Llama model, it did not have, it was not allowed for use in commercial and commercial purposes. And what's happened is the open source industry has effectively recreated that model and rebuilt the weights behind it you know, in the open source world um, uh, that, that, that duplicates much of that functionality and now makes it available for people to work with um, across commercial and as well as research purposes. So it's very exciting. I mean, what's happening. I mean, the, the fact that, 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 that so many different things are happening simultaneously uh, just really makes this a, a, a time of great change. So um, let's think about this practically, right? Let's assume I am the managing partner of one of the largest law firms in the world. And I have 100 years worth of depositions and recordings and briefs all archived in my firm electronically. Is this where the world is going? Is it possible now for me to get that entire source body of knowledge, give it to some machine to train it to think like a lawyer? Um Yes, it actually is. I, mean, I think that, that, again, making that effectively, turning that into a, a solution still takes a little bit of 
of of self of, of of self work. It's not that easy to do that today. But yes, it is possible. I mean, essentially, what you can do, which is which is interesting, and you can do this with either the commercial models or with the open source models, is you can take the data sources that you have, and um, and turn them into a knowledge base that can be referenced by the models. You know, one of the challenges that these models have today, and it's you hear a lot about this, is hallucinations. And, you know, basically, if a model doesn't have uh, all of the information it needs to answer a question, sometimes it has a, they have a propensity to make things up yes. um, or hallucinate. But the model won't make things up if it has the correct answer in front of it, and it can find that correct answer. And so what you do is you take your knowledge base. You know, these, these, these models are trained on a set of content that's open source content, typically internet content, and they're trained in a period of time. You know, in the case of GPT-4, I think it was trained in 2021 um, and, and 2022. And, uh, uh, the, and, and so they're not up to date and they don't have access to a lot. They certainly don't have access to the internal information within an organization. So the way you can solve that is you can take your internal data and um, you know, first, first, if it's in if it's in audio recordings, use the language translation models to translate that into English text. So you have have data in the form of text that's available, and it could be part of your broad knowledge base, which includes articles and press releases and earnings reports, whatever it might include. And what you can do is take all of that data and apply machine learning to it to what's called create embeddings or a vectorization of that. What this is, is that it takes the, it, it's taking the, uh, the, the, the tokens or the words that are present in the English text, and it is leveraging machine learning to understand the sentiment and, 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 and what that text is talking about. And it turns, it moves it into what's called vector space. So it generates a set of numbers um, that are part of a multi-dimensional vector that represents the content of that text. And there's products uh, uh, that are called vector search engines. Pinecone is probably the most popular of those that allow you, these are databases that allow you to look up through semantic searches, uh, uh, similarity searches, to understand, uh, given a set of text, what is you know what is to content that exists in my corpus that is similar to this? So if I ask a question, I can leverage that. I, what I can do is I can take that question that I've asked, the words or tokens in that question, use vector databases to find similar text that has similar content, and then um, from that, uh, what I can do is take the content that comes out of that vector database, the the words or tokens and feed that back into the GPT-4 or, 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 or foundation model, the, the open source model, and actually provide it with more information, more knowledge to better answer the question. So instead of getting a hallucinated answer, I can get an accurate answer to the question because the, the, the generative AI is able to look at the actual content that, that, that is referred to in the question. And so, this technique can be applied across any big corpus. You know, it can be applied across product support uh, tickets, Slack messages, documents inside a corporation. I mean, there's just a million approaches to ways you can apply this. So sticking with the law firm example, right? Because I think everyone would understand that. So my firm has all this massive body of knowledge. And you talked about an open source model. And here's the part I want to make sure it's clear for the audience. Does the law firm have to then build that capability in-house or is there an external vendor that will do it for them? And here's the follow-up question. If it hands over that knowledge to an external vendor, what are the guarantees that knowledge won't be transferred to a competitor? Well, first of all, I'd say if, you, if you're trying to solve this today, people are building it in-house with bespoke solutions. Yes. That's going to change in the next six to 12 months, though. I mean, it, you'll start to see services out there that really help companies to take their internal knowledge 
and turn them into you know, vectorized knowledge bases that can be leveraged for artificial intelligence and machine learning. You mm-hmm. know, the great thing about these about putting your 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 proprietary corporate knowledge into a knowledge base that's that's stored in a vector database is you can re- maintain control over that. You can continue to control that and then only supply that to that information to the large language model when a question is asked. Now, if you're using one of the commercial open source, one of the commercial models like GPT-4, ultimately you are providing information to OpenAI. Now they have you know, said that they will keep information proprietary, particularly if you're using it to further enhance the model. But it, you know, that's a concern that some companies have. One of the advantages of using these open source models is, is that they can be run, you know, in smaller systems, in more in-house uh, or corporate uh, cloud environments. So people will be able to keep that data in, entirely within their domain. If you know, particularly if they're a regulated industry like a financial services organization where this is important. You know, in a year or so, the tools will be much better. Okay, but I just want to confirm something. That ability doesn't exist yet, whereby there is an external vendor who will take your knowledge and build it out for you and build the vector models and so on. That will come in time. That's right. I mean, I think what we'll see is a variety of different services that are taking and working with documents and a variety and information in a variety of different ways. And we are seeing, you know, some companies emerge already. I mean, one company I've been working on for a number of years that does this for a very specific thing, which is to work with business contracts and and business and and, and important business data. A company called Dakigami applies these these language models. Uh, in this case, they are are open source models, and the data is all kept proprietary and is not sent to anyone. I mean, it's it you know, Dakigami gets the data. But their 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 uh, their their rules and and license requires them to keep that data proprietary to the customer. It's customer owned data, much like Snowflake did when we we treated customer data as as very confidential. So Dokigami does that right now, whereby they will go to a company, they'll take all their contracts, they will create these systems whereby does the AI work to be able to respond based on the body of knowledge, but it ring fences that company's knowledge and makes it only available to that company. Exactly. And in this case, what they're doing is extracting information from business business contracts. That's pretty amazing. I mean, I've never heard of them, but it sounds like they're doing pretty interesting work. Let's shift gears a little bit because we always talk about text. We talk about audio, but what about design work, like architectural drawings? Do you feel that this is already happening with AI or it's something that could happen a few months down the line? Yeah, it it absolutely is going to happen. It, it hasn't quite happened yet, I don't think, but we'll absolutely see it. One of the the elements of of evolution that we'll see over the next few years in these models is something that's called multimodal. In other words, the models can work with multiple types of data. Today, we mostly are talking about large language models that are working with English text or 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 English tokens. Um, you know, we also have have some uh, that, you know, there are other models that exist that are multimodal that combine the ability to take a, take text and actually draw, create a create a picture. Uh, stable diffusion and uh, and Dolly are two examples of, of those of models that can actually create a, a visualization of something. Uh, we've seen now, I mean, in, in, in the case of chat of GPT-4, you know, GPT-4 can look at a picture of something and from a picture, uh, understand, you know, what that, that contents of that is and, and do something useful with it. And that's another form of multimodality. I think we're going to see models that can work with all different types of data in the next few years. In general, what I call I call this data that we're talking about here, you know, whether it's an architectural drawing, uh, a video, a sound clip, a uh, a point cloud, a laser point cloud that's taken, those are all what I would call complex data sources. They're data sources where essentially what what the, what's held by the di- digital device is is clear to a person but it's opaque to computers or has been opaque to computers. And I always give the example, you know, you can take a picture of a horse in a barn 
and show it to a four-year-old and they'll properly identify what that is. Yes. But until we had machine learning, computers couldn't do that. Now it can. It can identify the contents of just about any complex, complex data type um, and, and work with that information. The technology hasn't fully evolved to do this yet, but it's very clear, and this is a lot of the interesting things that are happening in the open source world, is the combination of these multiple data types and being able to add this intelligence of artificial intelligence to a different type of data, such as an architectural drawing. So coming back to my law firm example, would it be correct to say that if we look at two law firms, one of the law firms has spent a lot of time, money, and effort cataloging and building a database that it uses internally to train its lawyers and so on. And it's been very meticulous about that versus law firm B, we'll call it B, which hasn't done any of that. It really relies on the relationships its lawyers has with clients. It would seem law firm A, which is that body of knowledge has an advantage with AI. Is that a good way of thinking about it? Well, I think, I mean, I, I absolutely believe that that building knowledge and leveraging knowledge uh, is a critical element of every organization. And the data that an organization is, is, is able to collect and utilize uh, can directly impact the kind of performance they can achieve and, and the, their ability to successfully support customers. You know, that said, the only thing I would say to the example you're giving is that that's a very uh, personal kind of an example where the advice between people can also be very useful. And I don't want to diminish the importance of that, that there still is a role for a personal interaction uh, that, that all of us will have as we interact together that I think will be very much augmented and assisted by these AI assistants or co-pilots. But I don't think it will replace the role of people. But in general, yes, if you have a set of data that, it, that you have collected over time, that is an asset that can be leveraged now in new ways because that data or that knowledge can be connected with intelligence uh, that, that computers have, which has never been, ex never existed before. You know, since the 1960s, we've been collecting data. And of course, we collect it faster and faster, more and more every year and more and more different types. And we work as people to analyze and understand that data. We continue to do that. But what we're now seeing is the ability for machine. And what we're finding is, is that at least in a lot of cases, the machines can do a better job than we can, because in many cases, the complexity of what we're dealing with pretty much comes to the limit or maybe even exceeds the limits of what people can do. And machines are just able to handle and work with far more information. Yes. Let's switch gears a little bit, right? So I've been following this in the press and I saw there was an open letter signed by some of the leading developers, investors, and so on in artificial intelligence calling for greater government regulation because they feel that this could be detrimental to humanity. So give me your view on this. Why are we building something that we know or we think can be harmful? Why do we build a lot of things? To, I mean, there's a, harm can be caused by a lot of different things. I mean, how many people are killed every year in car accidents? Let's start with that. Uh, I mean, that's very harmful to people. We create all these weapons. You know, those are clearly harmful. They don't have it. You know, a nuclear weapon has no positive uses for humanity. Uh, unlike that, artificial intelligence has incredible positive uses that will help us in our daily lives and in our business uh, and almost immediately, and, and I think in a few years, we'll wonder how we live without these agents to help us and assist us. Um, I think they're go it's going to become very ubiquitous throughout society and throughout business. Now, the thing I think is really important when you uh, uh, talk about the, the concerns of artificial intelligence, and, and there certainly has been an enormous amount written about this in the last six months, is to distinguish between artificial intelligence as a tool used by people for people purposes. And that's what we're talking about today. When we talk about AI today, what we're talking about is how can it make us more effective developers and write more code? How can it help us more effectively you know, answer the questions that our customers are asking? How can it make our employees more effective in their day-to-day -day jobs? And we are going to see substantive productivity increases across the board because of AI, and that will just accelerate, continue to accelerate you know, business and accelerate growth and in general, improve the productivity of people. 
Now there's, you know, and, and there is, and, and people will take this technology and do whatever they want with it. And what that means is people, just like every other tool that's been created, people will use it for the good, for the bad, and unfortunately for the evil. I and mean, people will apply this to, 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 to negative purposes. And, you know, clearly an example of that that came out very early are the deep fakes, which is, you know, very negative use of, of this technology. Um, but those, what I would argue about that is that when AI is a tool used by people, people underneath it need to be held responsible. And we have quite a few laws in place to, to handle that. If I take AI and I try and use it to spam people, there are already AIs. There are already regulations associated with that that prevent that, that, that don't allow you to do certain things. You have to operate within certain bounds. And that will still be true. Now, there may be a need for some more regulation around AI. For example, the deep fakes that I just described, which were impossible before AI. Um, but I think that those will be very, very focused. So that's the short-term concern. Now, when these scientists are talking about existential risk and the potential risk for the human race, they aren't talking about this as a tool for people. I mean, as a tool, I think the nuclear weapons are far more existential to the human race than AI is in the hands of people. The, the concern that's being expressed, though, by these scientists is that are that the advancements in AI are coming quickly. And we now can see that, that while we're not there yet, we are not that far away from having machine intelligence that equals human intelligence across many dimensions. And, you know, that's often called artificial general intelligence, an, an AI machine that is essentially as intelligent as an average person. Um, we also can see that that can continue to progress and, and likely will continue to progress to get smarter and smarter until these machines are smarter than any of us. And at that point, we got to say, are we in partnership with these machines? Or are we in a Terminator situation? I mean, there's been an infinite amount of dystopian novels and movies and things about how AI can kill us, Terminator being one of the more, you know, one of the more popular ones. Um, but I, you know, I don't, while I think that those concerns are valid, you know, this is where I come in and say that, that the AI that is created is an expression of the values that we put into it. This is why I always focus on the importance of values within organizations. Services that are built today already express the values of the company, and that will just become more accentuated as, as more and more of these things are, are implemented by AI, AI assistants that, that do things on our behalf. And it's up to us to put the values into these systems. And I do believe that while we will have someday super intelligent AI that is smarter than we are, uh, if we are if we operate thoughtfully, um, we can prevent these doomsday scenarios. And I'll just sort of final thing I'll say on this is that is that I look back to the work that Isaac Asimov did decades ago in his discussion of intelligent machines in the forms of robots where he, he created the three laws of robotics that ensured that robots were tools that are used by people on the behalf of people. Well, it turns out that in Asimov's later writings, um, late in his life, um, you know, he died in, in the early 90s, but late in his, in, in his career, his robots had become had matured and effectively had, in some cases, become AGIs. And Asimov actually, at that time frame, decided that he needed a new law of robotics, and he created what he called the zeroth law, which is that a robot must not harm humanity or allow humanity to come to harm. And I think that that approach and thinking through how we can work as partners with these new, I use the word entities, entities that we may eventually create um, that have independent intelligence, how we can work together with them. And while there certainly is the potential for existential risk, I don't rule that out, I have far more faith in our ability to control that, much like we've managed to control the potential you know, doomsday scenarios of nuclear weapons, really ever since I was born, you know, I'm you know, over 60 years old now, and I've, I've lived under the, the potential gauntlet of, of nuclear war my entire lifetime, and somehow we've prevented it. So I'm confident we'll do the right things. So this is really a big bet on the values of the companies building the technology, and the people, and they can infuse that into AI. But switching gears here, yeah, 
when we look at all the talk around AI, which places in the world are leading the effort? Because for a long time, Silicon Valley was always at the forefront of technology. Is it still leading much of the work around AI? Yeah, it really is. In fact, I just read an article today, uh, I think it was in the journal, that that it, it's actually repopulating San Francisco. <laughs> that every all the techies, a lot of the techies moved out during the pandemic, and a bunch of them are moving back because they want to they want to be in 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 these uh, these 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 sessions where they can all you know uh, coding, it can all do this coding together, group coding and things to learn together. So yeah, it actually is still coming out of out of the U.S. for sure, and and in general, it's 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 Silicon Valley, San Francisco. So all the big work is Silicon Valley at this stage, and is it fair to generalize and say the rest of the world is playing catch up? Well, I, I mean, it's, you know, first of all, researchers are everywhere now. Let me just yes. start by saying that, you know, you can't, you know, while the centerpiece of it may be San Francisco, uh, the connected world we live in um, post pandemic, especially means people can live everywhere. You know, I would say, you know, the, Mark Andreessen wrote uh, 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 yesterday, he just came out with a, a, a blog where, you know, he, he it was entitled Why AI Will Save the World. And he's very optimistic. And I, in general, I'm, I, I'd say I'm mostly in sync with what Mark wrote there. Um, the, you know, the, the innovation is happening everywhere, but one of the things I think that's most interesting is potentially the, the, the race between the U S and China. And, and I think that's very much worth watching. And, and I, I don't believe we should slow this down at all. I don't think we should slow anything down. I'm thrilled that the open source community is developing a whole set of small, efficient models that can be applied in a wide variety of ways. And I think the only answer is actually more transparency, not not trying to stop things. And this is still primarily an effort that's led by the private sector in the United States, or is the government work in this area as well? Well, government is certainly involved, but I'd say it's very much being driven by the private sector. It's very much being private funding is driving most of this and most of these applications. You know, there are there are many, you know, every everything you can think of where you can think of how AI can help business and organizations, you can apply, obviously, the same things to government. Um, probably the one area where government is, is most focused, and, and, and I think private the private sector is, is not engaged directly, and, and I think this is a good thing, is on killer robots. Um, the military, you know, the militaries of the world will develop these, these tools as weapons. There's no question they will do that. Um, which, by the way, are outlawed by Asimov's laws. If you went back to Asimov's law, where a robot must not harm a person or, or, or allow a person to come to harm, it's obviously totally inconsistent with a killer robot. Um, you know, so that's one area where I think government will will do things, um, and it you know it will happen. It's not the area that that I think is is most beneficial to man by any means. Um, so it's not an area that I focus on as much. So just for the audience, right, because they are not as well versed technically in this as you are. Asimov's laws are not really laws. They are just his hopes, isn't it? No, they were laws. I mean, his world, they were, they were absolute in his world. They were built into the hardware. Um, he invented this idea. I mean, you know, remember, he, he wrote about robots before digital computers were invented. And his robots were not digital computers. They were powered by what he called, he called a positronic brain, which was, you know, he admitted that was just a made-up idea that allowed him to express his, you know, the, 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 the concepts that he wrote. But the, 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 the laws in, in this case were actually coded into the circuitry of this positronic brain, which while he never said it explicitly felt pretty analog to me based on, on, on the readings I've done. And, and, and of course our models don't have that. I mean, there, this is a very big distinction is in Asimov's world, uh, uh, the, the, the these these positronic brains were uniquely created with these laws built into them and of course the models that we create are very flexible and and they are they are governed by the values of the organizations that create it and the training they do to it um so it's it's important that you know to recognize that we have the ability to, that flexible to do almost anything with these these ai models that we want to want to, that we're going to build However, the Asimov's laws provide us with guidance for potential regulations, but more importantly, for the types of products and services that we want to, to see. The fact of the matter is, those laws are consistent with what a good product would do, right? It, you know, it doesn't harm people. You know, that's one of the first things about products. You don't want it to be harmful, and it does things on people's behalf. 
Um, you know, it does it does what you want. Those were tools. He he envisioned Asimov envisioned robots as tools to serve people, and that's exactly what AI is today. But just to make sure the audience, because we're using the word laws quite liberally, uh, it's not something passed by Congress and so on. It's just no. it's just our hope that we follow these laws, but and, there's and no it, guarantee. And I, in today's world, that is true. In Asimov's world, it was more than a hope because it was a technological certainty in his world. In our world, it has to be applied and, and made true based on the actions of people. And that may require some re regulation over time. Um, and I, you know, I think we all, the, the industry has demonstrated that it's open to that as appropriate. So switching gears here, what are some good examples you've seen of companies using AI to become, to better serve customers, to solve problems and so on? Well, I mean, I probably the best example that, that, that comes to mind, I mean, it's still early, it's still early days, yeah. but you know, the, this, the first one, the, one of the first high volume uh, services that were introduced was this was what came out of Microsoft and, and, and GitHub, which is which is the GitHub Copilot, you know, which has helped assist developers in writing code. And, you know, and, and what Microsoft did, and, and is finding is, is that for developers that have adopted Copilot, you know, 40 percent or more of the code that they actually check in has been written by Copilot, by an AI agent. And so. While this is not typically the highest the, the highest value code that that developer is writing, it's still code they needed to write, and their productivity has increased dramatically. And the idea that you know developers are, are are being hit by this is pretty astounding. So let me see if I understand this correctly. Right, you obviously have a far deeper understanding of coding than I have. So if I'm going into the system, do I tell? the system what to code how does it know what to code it's a couple of different things as you write the code it starts mm -hmm. to predict what you might be writing because it's seen so many other people write similar code yeah it's now also got a chat interface where you can actually tell it what you want it to write and it will do it and 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 you know, people are finding that it, it it can write pretty decent code um and and follow directions it's possible to tell these models to write a program that performs a set of actions and it'll go through and do it. What's maybe even more amazing, and I mean, I've seen these demos of this where, where the model writes a bunch of code and then the developer tries to run that code and, and the code doesn't run, it gets some sort of error. What you can literally do, and this is just insane to me, you can feed that error back into the model and say, hey, this didn't work, here's the error I got. And it says, oh, sorry, try this instead. And, you know, it, gosh darn it, it, it fixes the bugs a lot of the time. So the developer interaction, you know, what's literally happening um, is, is that the developer is literally, is, is literally doing a, 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 an assisted job of writing code. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's been some, some developers do multi, do group coding where multiple coders sit down together and work on a problem together because it's been found that multiple minds working together to solve a problem can improve the effectiveness of the job. Well, now with these intelligent co-pilots, every developer has the ability to, to work together with another, in this case, you know, artificial developer to help them write their code. So it's pretty astounding. And it, it's so early in the time. I mean, the thing I have to, to emphasize is this stuff is just coming out now and you know, it's just gonna get better and better and better. You know, the Microsoft guys are saying, hey, it's writing 40% of the code now, but we think it can write 80%. That's just crazy. That's just crazy. And this is a high order intelligence. And you think about it, you know, when you think about business process and what, what, what we do in business, so much of that can be augmented by these AI agents. That sounds almost science fiction-like if you think about it. And I can imagine how many coders would be worried about their jobs and so on. What are the the early thoughts in terms of the effect on, we've spoken about productivity, which it would appear would see a significant boost. What are the early thoughts in the world around the impact on employment at this stage? Well, you know, it's still early to know for sure. And, you know, and, and Mark, you know, in the paper, Mark Andreessen in the paper he wrote yesterday, he talked about, you know, the cycles of innovation that happen as technology improves and productivity improves that new opportunities open up and new things can be done 
it, it's not like it's a zero sum world where there's just so much work to be done. Um, as we discover new capabilities and we have new uh, and the ability to do things, new opportunities for jobs emerge. Now, the thing Mark sort of pasted over a little bit is that that doesn't change the fact that there's a dimension that has to be put into place on that that's an addition, which is called time. Because, you know, if these AI systems improve productivity and in the process they they eliminate some jobs, um, which I think they will do, by the way, mm -hmm. and they create, let's say they create twice as many jobs as they eliminate. Let's just, just say it. Let's just say that happens. That doesn't help necessarily the people whose jobs were eliminated, right? Because it's not actually clear that those individual people can be retrained to do the new task. So while at the aggregate, these things are always very good for society and they do generate innovation and improve productivity and allow us to all lead better lives, that doesn't change the fact that it may negatively impact some people in some pretty serious ways. And there's a lot to be worried about with that. Yes, but I remember the early days of Excel from Microsoft, how many people who were doing the work manually felt that when computers came along, laptops and all these tools like Microsoft Excel, it would put them out of business, but actually, because it was so easy to use and encouraged more people to go into financial modeling, what really happened is different from what you thought would happen. Absolutely. And, and in fact, that's clearly an example where a lot more opportunities opened up than, than, than were lost. And yet, I'll, I mean, I'll tell you, there's still places, you know, there's still still small businesses I go to that uh, that still do things on paper, paper and pencil. <laughs> that is true. I know of a very famous designer who does not work on computers at all. He does it on paper. He gives it to his lieutenants and they then program it in for him. And he's world famous, wanted all over the world. I think what we can say is that we don't know what's going to happen, but if we have the right values, good things can happen. That is my thesis. Look, my thesis is ultimately that this, is, this technology is all about people and about what people are able to do with this technology and how we, you know, how we as, as, as a species evolve in terms of, of everything that we are doing together. And, you know, if you look today, I mean, technology has impacted the lives of, of pretty much everybody on the planet. Um, you know, more people today have access to a smartphone than to a flush toilet, which is an interesting data point. And, and so it's had a huge impact across, across society, and I'm confident it will continue to do so. And I'm confident that in general, it will be very beneficial to society. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that that everything is all good. I mean, as I say, people will do bad things with this technology. And in fact, it will you know change jobs in a way that some people will be displaced. And that's a challenge that we have to deal with. Well, that was definitely one of the most interesting interviews I've had this year. So I want to thank you for sharing all of that. I think our audience is definitely going to love it. You definitely give me, given us a different perspective on what's happening in AI in terms of the limitations potential, the capabilities, the landfall, the landmines, and so on. So I want to thank you for making time to speak to me. Happy to do so. Glad to be here. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up? I mean, the only thing I'll just add is what I'm saying through this whole thing is it is just the final point is it's really all about people. And, you know, while I, I know that, that, that there's a lot that happens in the world, I continue to be an optimist um, in terms of, of what we will do as a society and how we will all work together. But we need to do that. I mean, this is we're all in this together. And more and more, I think these new technologies connect us in ways to realize how you know, we all have much more in common than difference. And uh, I just think these are technologies that are going to affect us in very positive ways, but it all comes back to what we choose to do with them. Yes, I think it's nice to end it that way because the most important thing is not to make decisions out of fear. For sure. Thank you, Bob. Be in touch. Great. Thank you very much.